Thank you. We have developed a constructive framework for design. That's what we spent time doing before the tea break. I gave all credit to the work by Walcott Sack, which was disruptive and transformative and enabled real progress to be made in sliding mode observer design. Um, and from that, we've seen that numerical processes can be developed that allow us to design the observer. Um, we um, have seen already um, that we can reconstruct signals. We expected that. I gave you a window on that yesterday when we looked at the control problem. Because for the control problem, we applied it to the pendulum dynamics. We looked at what the control signal was doing. And we saw that it was effectively um, cancelling out the effect of the sinusoid. On average, the discontinuous injection was um, reconstructing that signal and enabling it to be cancelled out. This is going to be really important here because when we look at a sliding mode observer, the discontinuous injection we apply is a natural means to look at the difference between what the plant is doing and what the model that we are using for observer design is doing. So it gives us real constructive information about plant model mismatch, which we can use for parameter estimation. We can use it for condition monitoring, as well as the classical approaches of using an observer to estimate the states. So the model we've got is the same one as yesterday. This is a repeat of the slide. We've got a pendulum rotating in the vertical plane. The cart position X is being manipulated to try and keep the pendulum in an upright position. We're going to use for our observer design just that same linearization. And correspondingly, we have the same linear model. So we note again the nonlinearity, and we note that when we're running simulations in the model I have provided for you, it, we are not simulating a linear model. We are simulating that nonlinear model there with parameters that have been widely used as a test case in the literature, so it enables you to compare other things. As a recollection, there's the AB triple. I'm using it here with a C matrix, where, for the point of argument, I'm assuming, I'm assuming I can measure X, theta, and X dot, and that the vertical velocity, so the vertical, the angular velocity, cannot be measured. So I have no angular velocity um, uh, uh, <coughs> in my measurements, but I can measure the angular position and I can measure the linear velocity of the cart. And as I've already mentioned, we're using the sliding mode control law that we developed in the first tutorial um, session. I think that gives a cohesion to the program of materials. I'm going to assume that there is some unknown disturbance distributed in the input channel. So I am just going to assume there is a match disturbance present. So the way the model is being constructed, we um, let that signal come in through the um, input distribution matrix. And if maybe just to, to, to show you, um, oh. if we look at the model here, nonlinear pendulum with observer, um, when we look at 
what is going uh, into our um, system here. How I've done it, I should probably... Thank you. How we've done it here is um, I have implemented effectively the error dynamics here. So if we look here at the B matrix that's driving this, we see here that we, we get our disturbance coming in as an input um, through uh, the, the system here. No, I haven't. I've done it through the input channel here. So this is not the aerodynamics. This here is purely the observer. So down here, I've implemented the observer. I've modified from yesterday the um, dynamics. So here, if we put, it's a shame I can't wave at both because um, we can't see the, the right-hand side of the equation. This here, there's no input um, in terms of the theta subsystem, but in terms of the X subsystem, we have the DC motor. This drives the control input here, U7, but we also have U8, the ability to put in U8 here, which is our nonlinear disturbance. Okay? I've built the observer for the system um, in a very classical way by having the calligraphic A and, and B that we have. The important thing to note about an observer is we don't have to transform back some of the coordinates if we don't want, so long as we apply the right transformations to get the right <coughs> signals, which are just the input and output. So I have actually chosen to simulate the observer in the calligraphic um, characters where here I've got the nominal system, the A cal and B cal. Here I've got the bit due to the linear dynamics. And here I've got the part due to the nonlinear dynamics. Okay? So that's how I've just implemented the, the, the observer as a state space block where the nonlinear injection from the observer is effectively coming in as an injection signal here, okay? So it has um, <coughs> it has uh, several it has uh, several inputs here, and those inputs correspond to the the, the control input, co correspond to um, the output error as required to um, uh, for our Lewenberg again type part, if you like, and this part here, which corresponds to the nonlinear injection. Okay, so um, if I go back now to my... Um, <coughs> ...model, that explains, I hope, how we got the match disturbance uh, 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 present. Now, before we start, it occurs to me that with all the stress of the initial setup, I promised you that you could ask questions, and then I forgot. Um, and so before we get going and actually doing this, I think it's a good opportunity to open up the floor and, and take any questions from the first session. I apologize for, for not doing that first, as I said I would. Do we have any questions? I know I took some during the tea break, but um, I don't know whether there are still any questions outstanding. All pretty clear? <laughs> Good. Okay, then. So... What we need to do for this design is we need to get it into that canonical form. Once we've got it into that A calligraphic, you know, the script A, the script B, 
the script C, so the curly ones at the end, where you saw it became very straightforward to write down what the gain element was, the linear gain element, to channel the discontinuous element, um, and to be able to have that vision to see how the proof um, worked to show the quadratic stability of the system, the finite time attainment of the sliding mode. So to do that, we have to um, perform some, some um, computations. Recall that it's slightly more intense than yesterday because we've got an A, a B, and a C. For control, we only had an A and a B, so we only had to deal with N and Q. Uh, sorry, N and M. Here, we've got to deal with N, the dimension of A. We've got to deal with M, the number of inputs, um, <coughs> because in our case, B is being used to channel the uncertainty dynamics, um, and C, which is, um, has dimension P by N, which corresponds to the number of measured outputs. So the first thing we have to do in MATLAB is find out the size of those matrices. So just like yesterday, we start by finding the size of the matrices here. So we have NN as the number of states, QQ as the number of inputs, um, because remember, these here are corresponding to disturbance inputs. That's why I haven't called them M, M, because here it just happens that we're channeling the uncertainty through the input distribution matrix. But as we saw in the previous lecture, we don't have to do that. We use D, which had dimension Q, here we've kept the dimension as Q. Um, we're using B because it's our choice to channel in that channel. We're calling it Q. Doesn't have to be B. And then we have PP, which is the number of um, outputs. Having found out these sizes, we can then start to build the transformation matrix matrices. Um, <coughs> perhaps before we start, um, I should um, do the preamble that in MATLAB that just um, shows us we talked about transmission zeros and. Oh, here it is, yeah. The, the way uh, we um, find out what these transmission zeros are, remember we have those existence conditions that says we need to have full rank of CD, in this case CB, to ensure we can find the unique equivalent control. And we've got to be able to... Um, have um, invariant zeros that are stable. To do that, we typically use the T0 command, which I'm showing you here in, um, in MATLAB, okay? Which finds the um, transition transition transmission zeros of <coughs> any triple A, B, C, D, okay? Um, uh, if we do this, I'll just check my A, um, my A is here, B is here, C is here. Um, I'm going to have to set up um, uh, a, a corresponding Z matrix for the T0 command. It's going to be zeros. I think it's going to be three by one. And so you see it's returned an empty matrix. We have no transmission zeros in this system. 
Okay? So we don't have to worry about whether they're stable or unstable. They're not there. Okay? So that upper dynamics, that A11 dynamics, that means we can stabilize it um, by choice of an appropriate L. Okay? But we need to do that check, first of all, because if we had a stable transmission zero, it would affect how we built up the transformation. And we can also <coughs> just, um, if we do C times B for this particular system, we can see here that it's going to have rank one. Okay, we've got an entry here. And so there is no problem with our existence conditions holding. Okay, you, full screen. So that gives us the constraints of the transformations we're looking for. So the first thing we can then do <coughs> is change our coordinates so that the output distribution matrix is zero times the identity matrix. And this is what this first series of commands do here. I formed that transition, uh, that transmission, um, sorry, transformation matrix here, whereby from having C in the bottom block, C times the state is going to put the outputs as the bottom P entries there. So the bottom P entries. For if they are, we're using C here and we're wanting Y um, <coughs> to appear as the, in the bottom P entries, we need to use the orthogonal space. So we need to use the null space. This effectively defines the range space of C. This here defines the null space of C. So that effectively pads out the matrix so that it's full rank. If we do this, Oops. Probably best to go to MATLAB um, and, and, and see this. If we go to MATLAB and look at the observer design uh, here and we see what TC looks like, we can see that the bottom part here was just the output equation. So the last three rows here are just <coughs> the output equation. All that first part of the command is doing here, this null space command, is padding out this matrix so it's full rank. If it's a transformation matrix, we want every space in the x coordinates to go somewhere in the new coordinates. So this matrix has to be full rank. So we need to choose something whereby um, X4, which we can't access by C, appears in this top bit of the transformation. Okay? So that's all that null space um, command part is, is doing. We then, having found the transformation, we transform AC, BC, and CC so that we go into a set of coordinates where the last P, in this case, three states are the outputs of the system. We have to partition the B matrix. Okay? Now, if we go back, if we look at what this is doing, um, what effectively do we need um, to do here? Well, let's just have a look at what we get when we do this in MATLAB. So let's, we've done this part. Let's construct the matrices. So the next command I'm inputting here finds the AC, the BC, and the CC. We've seen what CC looks like. Um, CC will just give us the last P 
<coughs> um, elements here, the final three ones will just be the output. But look what has happened to BC, because we've done nothing with BC, it's just been acted on by the transformation. It's got two parts here. Yeah? This part here, this bit that p-dimensional, 0, 0, 0.0, that is all acting in the output channel, and it's got this bit here that's acting in the non-output channel. Okay? So, what that... Um, Second, that next piece of the code is doing is partitioning this, uh, these two. So if I do them individually so we can see what we're getting from this. That's the top bit. The bits where the output don't act. And this is the bottom part the bits where the output acts. And that's where we are at the moment. <coughs> but we've got to do it because we've partitioned it into two parts. But we've already recognized we've got to be cleverer than that because we can't just partition it into two parts. And we can see why, because the disturbance is acting in both subsystems at the moment. Okay, it's acting at the bottom. Um, through BC2, which is not a problem because that's where we've got the output, but it's, all right, it's also acting at the top, where that's much more of a problem because we can't access that. Okay. So that's everything up, 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 up to now. I would have said with this, one of the main points at which you can go wrong or make a mistake is because you don't keep all your, your partitions together. It's highly important to keep those partitions together and to do that carefully with your notation. Um, otherwise, you can end up with problems. Right, so here I've got what I, I just showed you. We didn't actually write down what the A was, but we saw the C that has gives us um, this part here, which is the identity matrix. We've got the two partitions, disturbance acting in both channels, and then A has been pulled through to, to look like this. We don't have the required conditions yet. This certainly hasn't channeled the disturbance into channels implicit in the input. We can see this straight away. It hasn't channeled because this is implicit in X1. This X1 is not implicit in the output. Okay? So we need to um, look at BC and CC. Now, we know what we need to do with BC. It's just like yesterday. Okay? So, from the point of view of yesterday, remember, we used a QR decomposition. And we used that QR decomposition to push everything down to the bottom of the B matrix. And so, effectively, we do the same thing here. So, our disturbance channels here are implicit in BC1 and BC2, where this is BC1, this is BC2. And so <coughs> what we want to do is to create a transformation that will push everything down into um, channels implicit in the input. So the first thing we do with the BC2 is um, we push this down to the bottom. It's already there, but I've put the commands there that will work um, in case it's not. And then I've created a transformation because having done that, um, 
we can actually um, take a transformation down here that will pull this bit down into the bottom. So if we look at what happens when we apply this transformation, where bear in mind, rather like yesterday, T is orthogonal, we end up with a system looking like this. Now, I've paid a little price. I could clearly have made this still be the identity matrix if I wished. I'm sorry that one of my characters has jumped over there. That zero should just be <coughs> above here. But we have created commands down here so that um, we push everything down right to the bottom. So we've e effectively got three layers of system here. We've got this upper channel here where the output doesn't act. We've got this lower channel here where the output does act. And we've split that into two subsystems. One where the disturbance acts, which is this one here, and the rest where the disturbance doesn't act. So an extra step of not just splitting output and where the output doesn't act, but also disturbance and where the disturbance doesn't act. So this one here has dimension n minus p, which in our case is a 1. This one here has dimension um, 1 which is the dimension of Q, the, 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 the uncertainty um, channel we've got. And the remainder has dimension N, uh, <coughs> has dimension, sorry, P minus Q. So this will be P minus Q here for, 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 for that part here. Now, if we have transmission zeros, we'd need another transformation. We'd need to take this sub-block and we need to transform this subsystem. Okay? But because we saw, I did in MATLAB, the command T0 and we saw it had no transmission zeros, I don't need to do anything with this upper system. If I had transmission zeros, I would need to pull off those transmission zeros by making the transformation just to that part of the system and then ignoring the bit with the transmission zeros in, doing the bit I'm doing now with the upper subsystem, but doing it just to the bit that's left when you've eliminated the transmission zero because we can't move it. So what we do is we then try and determine a, um, <coughs> a gain which will give us the pole we want to this bit at the top here which we know is observable. Okay. So here I actually did the um, T0 command again. Transmission, we said they're invariant zeros. So just the same as for ABC. Um, and the zeros that, uh, that I did and, and showed you that there were no transmission zeros of the original system. The whole point of invariant zeros is they're invariant, so they're invariant transformation. Um, and so this system here, this AA, BA, CA, will have the same transmission zeros, so it's not, uh, not, um, uh, will give us just the same result. If we look uh, what happens in MATLAB, just to give us the vision for the, the bits of the system we're, um, we're applying to, again, this file here. Let's do the transformation. Which is effectively pushing the disturbance down, so it's all in the very bottom channel of our, of our triple. And then we can um, form the new matrices, 
which I'd already put into my slide. So here are the new matrices and we can check the A should be the same as I had on the slide or push down CA still the output is implicit down here. Um, in this code, in this code here, I have included the commands um, which I didn't execute in 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 the slide for because in the slides we're developing just for the pendulum. This code here has been developed for a general system. So this code here will actually do the transformation to observability form. Okay, here um, for you. So if you had a system with a transmission zero, this will put it in the right uh, uh, format and will take care. Now, if we do that, we should find in this case that it tells us dimension of the unobservable subspace is zero. Okay? So this has done all the checking. It's found there's no transmission zeros. So it's saying, I don't have to partition it for you. If it had, and we had a system with the transmission zero, this would have done the partition for you. So it would have put it in the, in the, correct, um, in the correct form. So then... We're in a position to um, <coughs> continue here. This is not going to do anything to our system. So if we look at BS, should be exactly the same as we started with, um, but it's there for completeness. You know, I'm not trying to confuse you by putting this in the codes, but I'm trying to make the codes general. So if you want to try this on other systems, systems in your lab, for example, you won't just sit, try and run them and then, oh, they don't work. So, so this will, so long as it satisfies stable transmission zeros um, and um, CD, full rank, these codes will work for, for, for any system and will design you uh, an observer. So that bit wasn't in the slides. Here we're now doing um, the bit which picks the poles. Um, so let's run this um, here I've picked P1 as minus 10 so that's the bit that's, that's not general because clearly I've got to design some poles so if you had a different system you would need to look at the dimension of this um, system here. So you would have a system of dimension n minus p minus r, because it would have taken off the r transmission zeros. So here I have to pick n minus p poles, because there's no transmission zeros. n minus p is 4 minus 3, which is 1, so I have to pick one pole. It will be n minus p if you have no transmission zeros as the number of poles you have to pick. If you have a transmission zero, then you have to pick correspondingly less poles, n minus p minus r. Because the point is you can't assign all those poles because the transmission zeros are invariant. They will be part of the pole system. So it will whinge if you try and um, allocate um, pole. It will tell you it can't. Um, <coughs> because it has um, so probably the most interesting thing from our point of view to look at is this L bar okay so the L bar <laughs> is um Seeking, if we come back to our um, commands here, here 
the L bar is trying to transform those elements up there, um, which, uh, 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 well, let's probably, let's go, go back a bit and see where we applied the place command is easiest. This here, these bits, these correspond to the top of our, did we print it out? Um, do I have? Uh, This bit's here. So if you look at what we got in there, the minus 0 0.1451, it's this bit here. Okay? We're using this bit here um, to, um, and we're choosing an L to be able to pit, place the pole at that minus 10 point that we want. Why am I using transformation here? Well, I'm using place which, remember, we used yesterday, and it's all about designing a feedback controller. So place picks a K that makes A plus B K stable. We know that we can solve the dual problem A plus LC stable if we replace A and B by A transpose and C transpose. So this is why these elements are transposed here. I mean, you don't have to worry about it in one sense because the code does it for you. So depending on the level you're coming at this, the code does it. So it's not for you to worry about. But if you're wondering why are those matrix transformations, it's because within the MATLAB here, we're using a command that's designed for controllers to in to design a stabilizing gain for effectively an observer subsystem, an A minus LC type problem. Okay? And having done that, it gives us the L, which puts us in a position to find that final transformation. So having got the L, we can find the calligraphic transformation, which I think, and is easier to see, I've put on my slides here. So we can see the minus 10 I assigned is up here. So I assigned the minus 10. It got pulled up there by the L transformation. So by using this L bar here, I... Um, stabilized, in fact it was stable before, I made it faster. For an observer, speed is important. You know, the, the, the dynamics are doing something. If you think about it yesterday, some of those observer designs, we were, so some of those controller designs, we were designing poles at like minus one, uh, minus two. We need to have things faster than the entry that was there inherently. We could have put L equals zero. The observer would still have worked. It just wouldn't have been quite such a good observer because in principle, we want those observer dynamics to be faster. We, likewise, we could have made it even faster if we want. We've still got this bit pulled down here, which is where the disturbance acts, and we've still got the input channels here. Um, sorry, the output channels here as the final um, P states. So we've got everything we need. That A, B, C, that A, B, D, if you like here, um, this is the calligraphic. So when I talk about A cal, B cal, and C cal, I'm using, in MATLAB terms, the, sub, the, the cal in the name to notice it's this calligraphic form 
which means the system has been transformed into the correct type of coordinates um, so that uh, 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 for our for our design. So having got that A11, A12, A21, A22, where remember that B1 and B2 are just the same here as the thing channeling the disturbance. Because in our case for this one, we're channeling the disturbance through the input channel. Okay? Everything we need to construct the observer. We know what A22 is. We can design a stable A22S. We know what script A12 is. So we've chosen A11 to be minus 10. I'm choosing similar speed of response, minus 11, minus 12, minus 13 to A22S. Um, and then I'm setting up P2, which is the solution to a Lyapunov equation here, which comes out of using the Lyap command in MATLAB, where A22 is just this diagonal matrix where I've picked the poles. And I've chosen quite a large row. Um, I don't need to worry about choosing a large row, as I've said. This is all about an observer design that's a numerical model. Choosing a, a large-ish parameter, row is 75, it's not going to give me problems when it comes to numerical problems. It's not like choosing 10 to the 15 or something, but um, I don't have to worry as I would for a control problem with um, issues around saturation of um, a real physical signal that's, that's in, in, say, the, the voltage applied to the DC motor or something, which will have a rated supply that we, we can't exceed. We have no such problems. So, <coughs> as I mentioned to you already, I've used the, the model we had before. So the top bit here is the nonlinear dynamics with the disturbance coming in. Here, I've got the controller. Note I'm not using the observer to design for the controller. At the, um, the, 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 the controller is just the same as yesterday. It's assuming all the plant states are available. I'm pulling off the three states that I know. So notice the observer knows nothing about the disturbance coming in here. So there's no feed forward from the disturbance down here. It's just going into the plant. And notice the observer knows absolutely nothing about the fourth state. It just knows about three of the state. So it doesn't know anything at all about the angular velocity. It does know about the input signal. Clearly the input signal is known. So here is the input signal from the controller yesterday that goes into our MUX block here to control our inverted pendulum. Here we see the control signal coming round and coming into the observer. So the observer um, knows about that control signal. It knows about the output error, which it uses to, um, <coughs> to multiply the linear gain. And this here is an implementation of the discontinuous part of the observer gain. So the discontinuous part of the observer gain, it's easier to assemble it here and then just feed it into an, uh, an input that here that drives the, the, the observer. Okay? So we'll, we'll go back into the MATLAB uh, uh, in, in a minute. But if we have a, a quick look here, we can see that um, what happens. So this is nonlinear simulation testing, just a few plots I put in from running this in my office when I was preparing this course, we can see that the error signals between the output and the nonlinear uh, model are shown below. Remember, this is a nonlinear model, um, so we don't expect everything to be perfect. 
it's probably a little slow. So I, you know, if we could quick, quick, quicken this up a bit, it might be desirable. But you can see that what I said right at the start this morning about the, uh, the ability of sliding modes to force that observer error to zero, it clearly does. So despite the fact it's a nonlinear model, not the same model that's in the um, observer. The observer just uses a nominal linear representation. We can see that these um, signals uh, go, go to zero. We can see that it's very straightforward to estimate the disturbance. So if we look at those error dynamics, in the canonical form we use to design the observer, this A11, remember, is stable. In our case, it has a pole at minus 10. It'll either have those transmission zeros or poles we picked, so it will always be nice and stable. We've picked this, which gives some asymptotically sta stabilizing um, action to the EY dot subsystem. And we've got the discontinuity here, to counteract something that's happening as some kind of um, unknown disturbance signal here. If we assume that we've got an observer as, as we have, and we've established a sliding motion so that EY is zero and EY dot is zero, then we see straight away what happens. In our calligraphic coordinates, we know that the equivalent injection, in other words, the smooth version of the discontinuous signal I apply, and in this case it is, it can be a discontinuous signal. I don't need to smooth it um, because it is an observer, so there's no problem with it being discontinuous. This depends on that disturbance signal that we've got, as well as the E1 subsystem. This is why it's important to give some fast poles to the rate of decay of the E1 subsystem in the observer, because once this has decayed, then we can see that the equivalent injection here lets us find out directly information about that unknown disturbance signal or nonlinearity in, in, in the system. So um, <coughs> because we've designed this calligraphic um, A11 subsystem to be um, stable, um, E1 will go to zero, albeit asymptotically, and therefore we know the equivalent injection signal is going to give us um, that signal. This was actually what we used yesterday in the control. You may remember I showed you small, smooth control signals. I said just a small parameter delta. I tend to do the same thing to in, uh, construct the equivalent injection in observer case. So I replace what we had, which assumed that delta was zero, which was what was presented um, in the lecture this morning, I put in, I add into the denominator a small positive co constant delta here to smooth the constant, to, to smooth the injection signal. And then I can show that if I approximate this equivalent signal, then I can... Um, reconstruct FIT. So it isn't just that I can see it or see something um, relating to it happening. I can actually reconstruct that signal. Okay? Because these are this is calligraphic B, which has just come out of my canonical form. This is rho, which is the size of the switch in my observer. I know it. This is the output error, and I've picked a small delta. I can do this online. I can do it in real time. 
I can reconstruct this signal as a function of time with time online and in real time um, very, very simply, which is very powerful. So it isn't just saying something's happened. It's saying, I know exactly what that signal is. I know what it looks like. I know its characteristics. Um, uh, and I can determine them from my sliding mode observer. And it's very accurate. So I did some um, simulations where I put in a triangle wave. So here's a triangle wave. So I put it in on the input. I've got three detector signals here corresponding to each of the outputs. Okay, because I'm clearly injecting into three channels. It's this matching that we've got between those channels. Um, if we look in our inverted pendulum at the three channels, we can see that we get pretty good reconstruction here. Pretty good reconstruction of that triangle wave. It's not perfect because as soon as I start smoothing that equivalent injection, I lose some accuracy. So we see a little bit. Um, we also note that we're sampling the output as well, which can um, give us uh, uh, some, some, some issues. But I think that for a signal you don't know, this is pretty powerful in terms of seeing the characteristics of the time varying signal. Somebody asked me a question, and this is, this is, I would say, the quick, the tidbit, really, of where most people go wrong with sliding mode observers. Where me, most people go wrong with sliding mode observers is they design them just as we've, um, um, just as we've done. Um, and then they go and implement them on, a, on their lab system or plant or process or whatever it is. And that plant will typically have a, a sampled output. So there will, you will know the measurement not continuously. Everything we've seen here, the measurement is continuously known. And this is an issue for sliding mode observers. Um, the theory says we switch with infinite frequency. You know, we said that. It has to keep us on the sliding mode. As soon as we start employing sample data environments, we have to be a little bit more clever about our choice of games because we see what happens if, if there's not. Um, this, um, I'm not assuming I know anything about the sampling characteristics. It is for the pendulum, so basically for the model you've got, I've put a coarse sample and hold on the output. So rather than the output signal coming directly into the observer, I'm sampling it slowly. Okay? And then what you see is the reconstruction degrades. Okay? Now this isn't the end of the world. We, I've done some work. I, I haven't got time to present it in this course because of all the different things that we, 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 we're putting in the course. We, we, can't, we can't do everything. But I think you can see that there was a lot of freedom. In how, I didn't say anything about how we chose those poles at all, did I? You know, We just sort of guessed them and said they needed to be fast. There are ways you can solve this problem taking into account that sample rate. And as I say, I haven't got time to go through that. Um, and, you know, some of the background theory is quite mathematical. What you do is, is not so um, challenging. Fundamentally, there is a result that says if you have a sampled output and you know the sample rate, and for real engineering systems, we usually know, roughly, to some reasonable accuracy, the sample rate. But if you know the sample rate, then you can represent that system with sampling as a time delay system. Okay? And for that time delay system, you so what 
you have to do is you have to take the sample rate you know, use the results that says, well, this I can model as a time delay system. And when you get to choose your gains, you choose them to minimize the impact of the time delay. And we've done some work, it's published work that sh shows you how to use LMIs to, to solve that, where basically we can make these results much better. Okay, so these results much, can be made much, much better, but it's something to be aware of when you do your own designs. If you just do them and then just apply them and you don't think sample rate, you may see different things happening which you know, you think, goodness, it's not looking like I expect it to look like. The first place I would suggest people look is in the sample rate. If you have a system where sampling is slow, I would suggest you use it at this stage we've just been doing for the pendulum and use the sample rate information, approximate it by the aligned time delay system and choose your parameters well so that they um, are good ones for your sample rate. And by doing that, you can very much, um, very much uh, improve uh, those uh, results. Okay, so what I want to do now with the, um, we haven't got loads of time left, but I want to, um, look at some things in the in this in the simulation we think it's battery could have gone come back now thank you okay let's go back um we got our design for the parameters so I'll just do that and then okay so at this moment in time if we look here I haven't got a disturbance signal so I'm going to look first of all. Oh, I just I think I've somehow disconnected the. Um, yep. Sorry about that. So at this moment in time, I don't have a disturbance signal. I'm just first of all going to run that nominal design. If we have a look at the poles that we picked in the latest um, version, we can see they're just as I had here, minus 11, minus 12, minus 13, and we've got the minus 10. Um, the design I've run here, which is the controller design, um, it's got dynamics of the order of minus 4.5. So we would probably expect that to be um, a little bit slow. Let's um, see what happens if we plot the error. Let's just have a look. Did I? Yeah, so, so if we do plot time and let's look at the sliding mode first. So here I'm looking at the difference between the output of that non-linear pendulum system and the output of my observer where I would expect to see a sliding mode um, attained. We can see it's going to zero. If we look at it here with a zoom, yeah, we can see it's very small. So um, still, 
converging because it's asymptotic in the E1, but you can see that within a few seconds, very, very small from that uh, EY. If we look at I'm hoping this is going to work, but I may not have no, we can't uh, we can't uh, do that. Let's have a look at the injection signal um, which I think I will have called new equivalent. Oops. Hmm. Oh, no, that's because I didn't, I haven't got a comma. Got a full stop. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So we can see that they're quite smooth in terms of the injection signals we're applying. I have actually smoothed it. We can have a look and see if increasing new will uh, increase that speed of response. So if we look here, I think we'll get the ability to... Um, change new. So here, let's put in something, say, minus 50. So I'm effectively just increasing the size of the switch in the discontinuous control element. So I'm just increasing the size of the switch And we'll see what happens this time. It's a bit slower to run now because it's dealing with, you know, the MATLAB numerics are, are dealing with a much bigger discontinuity. Let's have a look what happens. Bearing in mind, try and keep in our mind the, the kind of um, sliding mode we had before. We can see much quicker, yeah? Much, much quicker response. Um, and if we look here... We can see the error is smaller. I think so. Here I'm just zooming about the same time as we had before. So you can see much closer to the origin. Okay. I could also try and achieve the similar, but we can see the degree won't be the same. The switch is good for us. This is why it's beautiful that within sliding mode observers, we needn't um, worry about the magnitude of the discontinuous signal. Here, I've put it back to minus one. So it's what it was when we started the session. And what I'm going to do is go into the observer design and I'm going to make these poles much faster. So I'm going to make the, um, um, the, the pole in the upper subsystem minus 15. And I'm going to make these, instead of saying minus 11, let's make them minus 21, minus 22, minus 23. And let's save that and run it. Okay. So if we go back to the simulation model and run it with the new parameters. So remember... I've put the, the big switch back. We've seen the switch is good. It makes the discontinuous injection very good at getting um, the um, sliding mode attained quickly and um, to ensure 
that it stays very small. So it gets there and stays there very small. Let's see what the linear, in, the impact that the linear injection has. Um, do the plot. Probably a bit better. Not as good as with the bigger switch. Okay. So we can, probably what we can do is keep the poles there, trade off the slightly smaller switch. So in here, um, I'm going to um, make that row. I can't remember what I had before. Can you remember what I had before? 50. Let's go 40. See what happens. Okay, let's run that now with the bigger switch. So again, a bit slower to run with that bigger switch. We look at the sliding function. We can see probably not much change, I would have said, in terms of the rows. Let's see if putting it up that little bit more will, will help us. So we had 50 before. again what we might be seeing is there is some amount of uncertainty that is a magnitude such that something less than somewhere like 50 is not quite sufficient to counteract it Let's close it and do that again because it looks as if none of this is making any difference anymore, doesn't it? I suppose maybe a little bit of difference. Let's have a look. Um, uh, I want to get a good design before we put any uncertainty in there. So you can see... very small yeah. now what I'm going to do is I'm going to take away this constant of zero which I had there so this is just I wasn't applying a, a, an uncertainty um, so if I delete that How do I delete on this um, computer? How do I get it to delete the... Yeah, well, that, that's what I thought, but it's not, <laughs> it's not doing it for me. It's just this one. Oh, right, okay. So we'll put the sine wave there. Learning from yesterday, I will up the frequency a little bit so we can see something happening. And I'm hoping that this will be big enough to be able to counteract the nonlinearity that's now going into um, Has everybody got it working okay on their machines? No problem. Good. So as soon as I see something like that, I know my row isn't big enough. I see on my sliding mode dynamics, 
the disturbance signal coming through. So let's increase the row. So let's make the switch have bigger magnitude. So let's say take that to be minus 75. If we look now, still a little bit of a problem. We're still seeing it coming through, so I'm probably going to have to take it up still further to be out to get really good. It'll be good to see the recon reconstruction. So let's just see with that thing which isn't quite sliding. Let's look what's happening to new equivalent. Um, we should see it coming on the one injection signal. You can see the pro so this will be the dominant one, like we saw the triangle wave. We can see it coming through on one of the others. It's because we aren't quite attaining that sliding mode. The blue one is quite close, the other one is not. Um, so I think we would want to try and um, increase this still further, which doesn't matter because you know it's just a it's just a computational tool. It's not going to change the gain on an actuator or anything like that. So it is going to be a bit slower because I've got a bigger gain. Um, sit. So we're still seeing a little bit, um, Probably what I would do with this is in here, I have got a delta of 0.05. To get it to slide, I'd probably take down the delta. So if we run it with, because I've been running it with the smooth signal, which of course I don't need to do. So I'm running it now with something that much more approaches the discontinuity. And in this way, we'll see it slide. Done. See? Now it's perfect. The error between the output and the observed output identically zero. All I did was took off the smoothing on the discontinuous injection. So if we look here, because in a way it's a bit lazy for me to include that in the simulation because it is better to apply the discontinuous signal. You can see that with the discontinuous signal, you know, that's 10 to the minus 4. We're hardly seeing anything. 10 to the minus 5, we begin to see something. If The problem we'll have now is if we look at the new equivalent, which is just my applied signal, it might not be smooth. Actually, we're okay. We're lucky. It's smooth enough. If we do a zoom, we should see one of those signals only beginning to pick off the sinusoid, yeah. So the other two injection signals 
Nothing is coming through there. We just have it on the one and we see it coming up there. So all nicely working. If you do have to um, make the switch so high that you start getting chattering, because this is the one actually, I'm just using the one in the simulation. I've done no post-processing. If you have to use a big switch and you see the discontinuity coming up on here, and you um, then all you need to do is to push that signal through filtering um, to look at the... Um, a, 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 you know, to look at the disturbance, which you can easily do. Here I've tried to be efficient by using the, the signal that I am applying in the observer directly to um, see what's happening with the, with, with the sinusoid. So to conclude um, what we've done this, this morning, um, we've developed some of these sliding mode observers. Um, this, and they're not that difficult to design. You know, you have the machinery. You might not understand all the details, but in what I presented this morning, there's enough to get all the details. But in what we've done in, in this session, there's enough to do it. So you can actually do the ob observer design. The real strength of what we've done is to show that using the equivalent injection within the observer um, framework is very important for solving model-based um, fault detection and isolation type problems. When people started off, there was a tranche of work that initially tried to use sliding mode observers for FDI, um, fault detection and isolation, where it said, well, we want it to be that when there is a fault, there will be a break in the sliding motion. But that is incredibly difficult as a test. You know, they were trying to use the sliding mode as a residual generator. Those of you who know about residual generators in fault detection and isolation, they were using the sliding mode like that. They were saying, when it breaks in the sliding mode, it must mean there's a fault. But these are ASO robust and the results are conservative, that you, the condition for breaking a sliding mode is quite difficult to you. So you could easily have a fault and the observer would have kept a sliding mode. So people decided that this wasn't a good approach. It wasn't, it wasn't robust. The sliding mode approach was too robust. So you couldn't use the sliding mode as a, it, looking at it itself, the residual generator that by looking at specific signals and seeing the actuator and the sensor force directly, you had a, a good means of doing FDI. And it's really constructive. You can run it in real time. You can see that little function there. It's no massive machinery. You know, there's no massive intelligence in there in terms of what happens with some fault detection approaches where there's all kinds of learning and decision-making, et cetera, et cetera. We're looking at real engineering signals here and just making direct um, decisions. Um, I have to say to you the, the bit I've said already, which is, you know, beware sampling. We have a, a saying in England, I don't know whether it translates into Indian, um, because often these, these kind of, of sayings don't in, in language. But we have a saying that says something is the elephant in the room. It's kind of the big thing in the room that nobody thinks about and doesn't expect to be there. So in terms of sliding mode observers, sampling is the elephant in the room. It, that's the thing where if you're going to trip yourself up, that's probably going to be why. So that is the thing to very much um, bear in mind. So that is everything I had to say this morning. This afternoon is very much going to be applications focused, me talking about problems that we've worked on and what we've done, how we've got around certain things and the kind of results we've got. I don't know if anyone's got any questions before we go and have our lunch. It may or may 
may not. Yes, it depends, you know. Um, CC, it will be an orthogonal matrix. So, um, um, but numerically in MATLAB, it, it, we can't, it, it isn't the case that it would necessarily be the same because it's being driven by that need to pull down the B, within the B. We need to, um, well, we need to have something, we need to have the outputs implicit in that final subsystem. So, so long as it's populated with things around the outputs, that's fine. Well, that's a very good point, and um, you'll see in some of the work we've done, you have to be very careful about that, because what's a fault and what's an uncertainty? And that's why these channels and what we look at and how we est what we measure um, and what we estimate is key. And um, that is far more important than how we do the design. But you're quite right. We have to be knowledgeable about the channels and know what acts there and why. And, you know, sometimes if we've got a channel which has a lot of nonlinearity or uncertainty and may have a fault, then we may well need to look at other information so we can distinguish between what, what, what is which, if you see what I mean. No, I mean, um, there aren't design, uh, when we talk a, a little bit about the um, differentiators tomorrow, I'll talk a bit, um, or might mention a bit about adapting rows. So, you know, for some of these with observers, what we may do in practice, I don't tend to do it because, you know, for row, uh, for an observer, big is good enough. Some people go to a lot of uh, things by trying to tune the row and have an ad adaptation mechanism to make sure it's just big enough. But if you're running an observer for a long, long time, you have to be very careful if you have adaptation mechanisms because you can have things that adapt into very large things um, which are, 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 are not desirable. So, so um, I would say for an observer, don't worry about big. Just use big, and as we saw for, for, for my observer problem um, when we were playing with the simulation, putting big there and discontinuous solved all the problems. So for the observer, I think that's good enough. If it's an area where you want to do more, then the best ways are probably adaptation mechanisms where you can adapt. I mean, there I'm usually, uh, I look at the poles of the controller and I try and make, I mean, we do have a problem in that we've got transmission zeros in there, we can't affect them. So that can limit the performance. If we've got a slow transmission zero, it will limit the, um, it will limit the observer. Um, but fundamentally, um, we, just as for any observer design, we would try and make them sufficiently fast when compared to the closed loop poles. Yes, you can use the you can use the sampling rate. Yes, I mean I haven't presented the how to do that, but if you have an ABC and you know the sampling rate, um, it is possible to write down an equivalent time delay system and perform the observer design for that. I worked on that with Amelia Friedman from Israel. Um, we have several papers in that in that area. I can give you the references. If people are interested in following up with that, if you've been designing observers and you think time delay is a problem, we have results to help with that. Sometimes I give them in my presentation, but there was not time with all the other things so unwanted in the, in, in, in the course. So I had to not, not, not include that part. It's also very mathematical. Yes. It's a continuous time delay system. Any other questions? Um, 
Yes. 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 Well, I prefer this. Um, that's why, why I use it. Some people do very fancy things with different layers and, 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 and things like this. I typically don't like, I, I like this because it's smooth. It's a continuous function. Yes, yes. Yes, but you will have a corner in your implementation. I don't, you know, so you will have a, you will in terms of, you know, you will have something that's linear and then you will saturate it. I do not like corners. I prefer to have smooth functions. Mathematically, they are better. I think many systems that are continuous prefer continuous signals. But it's preference. I'm not saying it won't work. Um, but I prefer continuous signals. So not qu you have got a quasi-continuous signal. So it has points where it's not continuous. I prefer not to implement those kind of controllers. Okay, so I see... Oh, sorry, 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 I didn't see... I mean, uh, you know, unmatched uncertainties are much easier for an observer, you know, because unmatched uncertainties, we can construct other outputs. So, um, you know, for, for the observer, we're interested in matching to the output. And, for example, with the differentiator that we will learn about tomorrow, that is a way to reconstruct other outputs. So um, once you have other outputs, you can design something or use a differentiator, for example, to get a signal which is in the channel of your disturbance. That is much easier to do than getting the disturbance. You can get it indirectly from using the signal. Where, of course, with control, it's much more difficult. If it's unmatched to the input, in general, they're not going to redesign the plane just because it's convenient, you know? But for an observer, there is much we can do with creative use of analysis and frameworks such as um, differentiators, um, soft sensors. Um, we will see one this afternoon where um, there is a signal that is not matched to the input, but we can still get a framework that very nicely lets us do the estimation. Yes. Well, in this particular example, you would start to have, you've got to have the rank condition, so that gives you a, a limitation in terms of... So, so those two conditions on the transmission zeros and the rank condition is what would de determine that. So different... For what you're saying, that would give you different Cs. And the different Cs would affect the invariant zeros and they would affect the rank condition. So, so long as you had something that made CB full rank and didn't have unstable transmission zeros, then you could do it with, with less information. Okay? I will see you all after lunch.